Hello and welcome to Chapel. Over the, over the past few weeks we've been going through different emotions as seen in the movie Inside Out. This week is the emotion of disgust. We're going to be asking some people what makes them feel disgusted. And I wonder, what about you? The coronavirus makes me disgust. Um, I think it's terrible and it makes me sick to my stomach. And if I was to get the coronavirus, I would feel disgusted as well because it would make me sick. Like, thinking about the coronavirus makes me sick. I was disgusted by Nathan Lyon in the Australia vs India test. That was just a poor performance. And we bought budgie smugglers that had Nathan Lyon on him. And then he just, he only he got hit for two for 73 or something like that. I was disgusted. Okay, so some of the serious things that made me disgusted. Misogyny. I really get disgusted about misogyny. Uh, some of the more mundane things that made me disgusted. Eggplant. The texture, just the consistency, I can't handle it. And um, what else makes me disgusted? When I open Canvas to, you know, look at, like, class submissions, and there's just that, like, the blank dot because someone hasn't submitted it. Devastating. All right, what, what makes me disgusted? Definitely drinking expired milk. I've been there, done that, and I did not want to do that again. I feel disgust the most when I watch the news and hear horrific news stories about injustices and bad things happening, particularly to vulnerable people like the elderly or to children. What makes me disgusted is um, you just have to watch the news most nights. It's just injustices in the world. Um, you know, we're very lucky that we live in a great country and when I, when I see people being treated uh, unfairly or just, be, just being unlucky uh, that they're in the, the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, that makes me disgusted. The other thing that really makes me disgusted is, is um, seeing dangerous drivers. Now that my, my eldest is driving, um, I'm, I'm somehow more aware of what goes on on the roads than ever before. And um, just people who are dangerous or foolish on the roads, that's, that disgusts me. What makes me disgusted uh, is uh, when I am in a traffic jam and I let someone in and they don't put their hand up to say thank you. Uh, manners are important people. Something that brings me disgust is slices of tomato. No good. Uh, yeah, something that makes me disgusted is Greek salad without any feta. Yeah, that's just a disgrace. All right, disgust. Uh, look, when it comes to food, bananas just freak me out. Uh, they, I find them quite disgusting. Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, TV programs that warp uh, human relationships and marriage, like Married at First Sight, like I hate those, those programs. Um, and I find them disgusting. What makes me most disgusted would have to be when people don't finish their food and they chuck it away. That's just, I can't handle it. I hate seeing people do it. I hate it. that uh, disgusts me is cucumber. Ugh, hate it. And also, I'm a sympathetic vomiter. So if anybody else around me, I'm gone too. So what makes you disgusted? Laziness. That and McDonald's chicken nuggets. Those are gross. Feces, urine, toilets, sweat, cut hair, vomit, open wounds, saliva, dirty feet, eating with dirty hands, bad breath, smelly people, yellow teeth, flies, maggots, lice, fish smell, dead rats, rotting flesh, parasitized meat, wet cloth stickiness, decaying waste, garbage dumps, sick people, hospital waiting rooms, kissing in public, bad manners, and betrayal. Now, believe it or not, I've just read to you part of a list of things that we as humans find disgusting compiled by Dr. Valerie Curtis, the famous behavioral scientist and self-described disgustologist who sadly died of cancer last year. Uh, known for her work in championing hygiene and sanitation, Dr. Curtis claims that disgust is a powerful emotion that in one sense rules our lives. It dictates what we eat, what we wear, what we buy, even how we vote and who we desire. And this is mostly consistent with how disgust is personified in the film Inside Out. In Inside Out, disgust is the emotion responsible for determining Riley's tastes in food and fashion as well as helping her navigate social situations. 
She's the one who prevents Riley from having to eat broccoli. The one who stops Riley from appearing too desperate in front of the cool girls in her class. The one who knows better than to let Riley be seen with her parents in public. The way that Joy puts it, disgust basically keeps Riley from being poisoned physically and socially. And Dr. Curtis would back this up. In her book, Don't Look, Don't Touch, she claims that disgust is actually a form of natural selection. She says that if we were to imagine our ancient ancestors, well, the ones who ate feces and drank urine and dabbled in vomit, well, they would have all gotten sick and eventually died out. It's those who had a good, healthy sense of disgust who knew to stay away from doing things like that. Well, they're the ones who survived and multiplied. You see, according to Dr. Curtis, the role of disgust is ultimately to keep us away from sources of infection, whether that be parasites or the animals and insects that carry them, or worst of all, other people and their emanations. And in that sense, disgust is a lot like fear. It's an emotion designed to protect us, to keep us safe from potential harm. But like fear, disgust can easily get out of control and it can dominate our lives in ways that end up being more destructive than protective. When we turn away from the homeless, when we hide away the elderly, when we push past the disabled, when matters of personal taste become opportunities for judgmentalism to thrive, when a person's mistakes result in them being publicly shamed and even cancelled, and when your own mistakes result in crippling self-loathing that cuts you off from any possibility of redemption. How do you stop that happening? How do you keep disgust under control? Well, in today's Bible reading, we met a woman who, through no fault of her own, found herself the object of her community's disgust. Mark tells us that she'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And whilst he doesn't go into the specifics of her condition, most scholars agree that it was some sort of gynecological hemorrhage. In other words, a fistula. Now, for those who don't know, uh, this could be pretty confronting, but basically a fistula is technically a hole or a tear between a woman's birth canal and her bladder or rectum. The tear often occurs during a difficult childbirth and it leaves survivors leaking urine and or feces through their vagina. Now, thanks to effective maternal health care, fistulas are virtually a thing of the past here in Australia. But in many parts of the world, they continue to be a real problem. According to the Catherine Hamlin Fistula Foundation, an organisation dedicated to eradicating fistula, in countries like Ethiopia, more than 70% of births take place without a doctor or a nurse present. The result is there are more than 3,000 fistulas that occur each year. The women who suffer from them are left with no control over their bladders and or bowels. And the constant flow of urine and feces makes them not only undesirable to their husbands, but cut off from their communities. Because of the smell, they're usually left to fend for themselves, inhabiting huts on the outskirts of the village. Now, it's pretty hard for us to imagine the self-loathing, the despair, and the utter loneliness that must characterise these women's lives. But the woman in today's reading knew it. For 12 years, she knew it. And what's more, this woman lived in first century Palestine, where Jewish law classified things as clean or unclean. And by extension, people who came into contact with these things as themselves clean or unclean. To be unclean meant that for at least a little while you had no place in community with others or with God and you needed some form of atonement to restore you. So there were certain foods that were prohibited as unclean foods. There were certain activities that resulted in uncleanliness uh, necessitating ritual washing in order to purify yourself. And of course, there were certain physical conditions that made a person unclean, including sickness. The Old Testament book of Leviticus has a specific chapter on uncleanness resulting specifically from bodily discharges. And the middle verses uh, speak directly to this woman's condition. Verses 25 to 27 state that when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge just as in the days of her period. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues 
will be unclean, as is her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean, as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. You see, uncleanness was contagious. Anything an unclean man or woman touched was considered unclean as well. And if you then touched it, you would be unclean. Now, it's important to note that having a discharge of blood wasn't in and of itself a sin. Rather, it was a symbol of sin. Being unclean was a reminder of how, because of sin, we as humans live in a world under the sentence of death. And because God is the creator of life, any man, woman or thing marked with the stain of death was seen as unfit to enter into his presence. This is why the Israelites used the blood of animal sacrifices to make atonement for their sins. Blood was a symbol of life. But in the case of the woman from Mark's story, the life was bleeding right out of her. The loss of blood suggested the loss of life. And so to the Jewish community, this woman would have carried with her the stench of death, both figuratively and literally. To them and to herself, she was unclean and therefore untouchable. Mark tells us that she'd actually suffered for years under all sorts of expensive but ineffective medicines and treatments until she went broke. None of the doctors could help her. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. And so, out of desperation, she did the one thing no one would have expected her to do. The one thing no one would have wanted her to do. She reached out in order to touch someone. Now, of course, normally this meant that whoever she touched would have been infected by her uncleanness and thus become themselves unclean. And yet, when this woman touched Jesus' cloak, the very opposite happened. Mark tells us that immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So instead of this woman's uncleanness spoiling Jesus' cleanness, Jesus' cleanness purified her of her uncleanness. And it's crazy when you think about it. I mean, the other day, I stepped in poo. It was pretty disgusting. And what happened? Well, it wasn't like the poo suddenly took on the cleanness of my shoes. No, my shoes got dirty. That's how it happens. It flows one way, but with Jesus, it went the other. When this woman touched Jesus' cloak, her uncleanness didn't spoil Jesus' cleanness, but Jesus' cleanness purified her of her uncleanness. And in that moment, 12 years worth of self-loathing, despair and loneliness disappeared. She was made clean, no longer an object of disgust, no longer excluded from the community, no longer barred from the presence of God. It's no wonder that at the end of the story, Jesus tells her to go in peace, using the Hebrew word shalom, which means wholeness, completion, fulfillment, and fellowship with others. Last week, we saw that Jesus is the great fear shrinker. This week, we see he's the great disgust dissolver. See, when Jesus was on the earth, he spent his life walking among and making contact with people who were disgusting in all sorts of ways. People who were disgusting on the inside, as well as disgusting on the outside. And just as the woman in Mark's story discovered, contact with Jesus did not infect him. His presence brought life, not death. And at the cross, he became himself the ultimate object of disgust, dying the most humiliating death reserved for the most shameful of criminals, so that by his bleeding, you and I are healed. Now, I don't know what it is or or who it is that you find disgusting. But the truth is, we are all disgusting in some way or another. Whether you care to admit it or not, we all have things in our lives and things in our hearts, things in our minds that we desperately wouldn't want others to find out about. Because if they did, they'd be disgusted. They'd turn away from us. So we all have things about ourselves that were they to come to light, Well, they'd rightly separate us from others and from God. Things that make us untouchable. 
And yet the Bible tells us that despite these things, God still reaches out for us in Jesus. And that his touch makes all the difference. His touch cleanses and purifies us so that we might not be slaves to self-loathing, but instead freely admit our failures and even find forgiveness for them. The touch of Jesus also humbles us so that we might not judge and condemn and cancel others, but instead show mercy, gently pointing out a better way. And more than that, the touch of Jesus enables us to look at and engage with and even touch those our own community might otherwise regard as untouchable, whether it be the homeless, the elderly, the disabled, the addicted, the obese, the chronically ill, or others. Jesus is the great disgust dissolver, and his touch makes all the difference.